Hey, well, have a seat, please, if you would. We're going to go ahead and, and hop into our, uh, our next Sunday or our next topic, if you will, in our new series called What About, where we are exploring uh, six different questions, we're calling them, that deserve attention. And, and we want to be careful that we're not saying that we can fully answer. We're taking a posture of humility because we need to. We do not have all of the answers. And some of the reason why maybe the church in the past or other people who associate themselves with the person of God have turned you off is became, because they came with like a strong answer. And if you didn't agree with their answer and you didn't buy fully what they were sharing with you, then you kind of felt ostracized. You felt less than and, and you found yourself in this weird um, argumentative state. Man, we don't want to do that here. Hey, at the AC, our goal in this particular series and just our culture is that we would get to dialogue with you, that we'd have the honor of entering into your life and building relationship and dialoguing with you about the things that are incredibly important to both you and us, and then lovingly pointing people to the person of Jesus. And, uh, and so that's what this series is all about. Uh, and, and, and we've called it What About? Because we are basing this on research from uh, the Barna Institute that gives us uh, about five reasons why most uh, millennials are no longer a part of the church. And we've dealt with a few of them. Um, and we've dealt with culture. Because, and now it's not just millennials who are saying this. You could probably ask people younger and older than millennials who would say, who would agree if they're actually not involved in a faith community, they'd probably easily agree with some of these things. We looked at culture, and one of the um, knocks against the church and culture was that it feels like the church demonizes everything that I love. It's like, I guess I just, I've got to basically not do anything besides go to church and read my Bible. And that, like, that's it. That's all I got. And, and we kind of explored, is that really like where God is in culture? Is that how he wants us to engage in culture? And then last week we talked about God and meaning. And the reports came in that, man, a lot of this demographic, people who've, who've like exited the church scene, they don't really... There's no real transcendency is the word. Uh, and, and preaching's unclear, and it just like doesn't matter. Like it doesn't matter to their lives. It's boring and, and it's not relevant. And so we talked a bit about what, what does God have to say about that? And, and we, we looked at our source of meaning being the person of Jesus in the Bible. And we just, we took a little time, we did a little exercise, and we said, is that a reliable source? And uh, we really digged into whether that's reliable or not. And then we invited people to make a decision based on that. Well, today we're talking about God and science. God and science. Because um, what we see here is, uh, again, from the research, is that there's a majority, or at least a majority that's, that's not here. I think it might have been either a quarter or a fifth um, of the people that were, that were interviewed said that they feel like the church is out of step with scientific debate and discovery. It's like, it's like you got the church here and science here, and um, they don't see where the two ever, ever like connect. And, and it's almost as if you would have to check your brain at the door to really be a Christian, is, is some, of the, some of the vibe that, um, that people are giving out there. And it's called, um, the, the, the terminology that they use is the young exodus, where they've, they've got six in ten young people leaving the church. And then there's another number that's pretty scary out there, the, the 97%. We're calling it like the forgotten majority. The 97% of people in Delray Beach or Boca or wherever you might be who aren't here. It's the 3% of, of, of committed Christ followers and there's 97% of people around us in the South Florida area who, who are not following Jesus. They, they don't see God and fill in the blank as, as a really relevant uh, source in their life as it pertains to how the scripture would describe that. And so, man, we're just exploring some things that are important to them because they are important to us. And these are also issues that are important to us. And so um, we're going to be looking at God and science and um, kind of taking, uh, taking this issue on. Now, look, like, first of all, <laughs> like last week, you know, I don't know how long this message is going to be. I know that they're going to play me off in a, in a few minutes with music. Okay, so that's my cue. Wrap it up, kid. You're done. So before the music starts playing again, I'm probably not going to hit every scientific issue, right? 
Like I'm not gonna, um, I'm not here to like convince you on this issue or that issue or like um, provide enough data that you walk out of here and be like, man, I'm, jeez, like that guy just flipped my scientific world upside down. Like I totally wanna be a, a Jesus follower now. That, that's usually not how it happens. Like I don't see a ton of people get convinced or argued into the kingdom of God. But the Spirit meets people in contexts that are loving, relevant to their life, and focused on Jesus. So we're going to try to do that, okay? And, and we're going we're to be in the, in the world uh, of science, and we're going to be talking about a couple of things. So a little roadmap here, um, uh, if, if, you, if you are kind of following along, if you can go to that slide that's got all five of the places that we're going to go, awesome. So we're going to talk about some approaches today uh, to science and, uh, and God and kind of like what people have done in the past. Then we're going to talk about some theology, like what's the theology of science according to the scriptures. And then uh, we're going to talk about what is, what's, what's it saying? What's it saying? Uh, number four is how Jesus changes everything. If you've noticed, that's always the anchor of every message. It's like it always comes back to Jesus changes everything because that's our great hope, right? And, uh, and then finally, it's how do we become a church that like celebrates um, um, God and, and science? And what would that what would that look like? Well, let's go ahead and hop in with some approaches, okay? What are some different approaches that people uh, have taken uh, in the past or, or currently? Maybe you probably fall under one of these approaches as it pertains to science, like the study of how things work and came to be about and, um, and stuff like that. So you might be, uh, if you'll go to the next slide that, that has all those approaches on it, thank you. You, you might be a God versus science person where you think that um, they're, they're kind of like enemies, you know, it's sort of like uh, you're either a God person or you're a science person. And usually when you meet and talk, we fight. That's just kind of like you're, so you have a, you kind of have like a confrontational um, posture to you. So uh, in, this, in this case, you're, uh, you're always kind of ready to, to like rumble, you know? So whenever the topic comes up, it could be creation, it could be old earth, new earth, it could be um, DNA studies, it could be all, any, any ethical type thing. Whenever that kind of comes up, you're like, what? You know, have you ever seen people, like, they kind of step back and they're like, what? And they're hoping sometimes maybe somebody will come and hold them back because they don't really want to fight, but they're, com they're ready to go. They're ready. So, so some of us, whether you're on the sort of the God side or the science side, when these issues come up, you're like, what? You're going to talk about that right now? And so all of a sudden you start swaying back and forth like this. Like, I've been in a lot of fights and know what that's like. <laughs> Um, so, so you could be a person that's a God behind science. Maybe you're the second approach. God behind science, this is a person that kind of walks around like this. It's like, yeah, I've got to lower my voice because, um, you know, I'm a Christian, but I know that makes me look like an idiot. And when I get around my other friends, they think I'm like an intellectual idiot. And so I usually kind of try to keep my Christianity on the DL because I know when we talk about science and stuff, I don't have anything to say. And, and so usually I just kind of follow along and usually I let my God be um, like behind science and it kind of, God kind of gets conformed to what the really scientific smart person's saying. Some of us kind of maybe are, are, maybe that's our reality. Third one is here, God and science. And this is, this is a posture where like over here you have God and over here you have science, but the two don't meet. It's like, they're, it's like they're better left, it's like they're better kept separated, okay? And so here's our God. So when we come to church, we're like, yes, Jesus, Bible, all those sort of things. But then over here, this is like the scientific world. And it's like, oh yeah, I can be intelligent. I can think through things and be curious, all, all those sort of things. And, and what we think though, is like we can't ever mix them. So we, we've, got some, we've got some good God stuff over here and we've got, and we, we've got some good science stuff over here, but we're afraid to let them come together because we're not exactly sure how that's gonna work out. So we either stay in one camp or we completely compartmentalize and then go to the other camp. And then the, the last approach is, is where we're trying to move today is God in science. What would it look like for us to begin to take an approach to the area of science where we are actually excited and curious because we know the more scientific we get, the more God will get where we start looking for God in 
science, where scientific discovery and scientific debate, it doesn't scare us, it doesn't anger us, it actually makes us curious to figure out where is God in the midst of this discussion. I know they're coming up with their own findings, and that's okay, because it's all theory. They're allowed to have their theory. I just have a, a framework, I have an approach that says, I'm so excited to find God in the midst of that discovery, to find God in the midst of that debate. And so that's where we land, if you will. This is our approach because we believe it's, um, it's biblical. And, and so um, I, I love this, uh, this quote here uh, from, from Steve Cable. I have a, uh, a, a couple of different sources that I'm going to let you guys know all about the sources uh, in our 10-minute recap. For every one of these messages, I do a 10-minute recap, and they're both, they're both posted on our app and on our, our website. And so I'll list all the resources. This is one um, that was helpful for me, uh, probeforanswers.com. The guy's name is Steve Cable, and he says this, by combining the general revelation of science with the special revelation of the Bible, we should be rewarded with a greater understanding of the nature of our creator and his intentions for mankind. That's solid. That's a solid approach to science. It actually helps set our theology for science. If you have your Bibles, we're going to be in uh, Psalm 19. And this is going to be sort of our, uh, our anchor verse, if you will. It's, it's, uh, it's in your outline as well, outline you guys had that might help you follow along um, as well. And, and uh, this, is, this is the biblical framework that describes God in science. And this is uh, what the writer David says in Psalm 19. He says, the heavens declare the glory of God and the sky above proclaims his handiwork. Day to day pours out speech, and night to night reveals knowledge. There is no speech, nor are there words whose voice is not heard. Their voice goes out through all the earth, and their words to the end of the world. Here's our working theology of science. It's real simple. It's basically this, it's saying something. It's our responsibility to listen. It's creation, it's saying something. According to Psalm 19, it's a, that all of this stuff, it's, um, it's proclaiming something. It says that it's proclaiming the glory of God. It's proclaiming the beauty of God. And where science comes along is it, it helps us to listen. It gives us the insight to listen to what creation is actually proclaiming. As a matter of fact, the, the deeper you go into the scientific world, the more facts and figures that you get, the, the, the more willing you are to explore this creation, well, the end of that is a greater understanding of what it's saying about its creator. That's our, that's our practical theology. That's our posture towards science. Like, give me more so that I can have more of him. Okay, so a um, couple, couple of thoughts here as to what, what does the scriptures tell us to be looking for as we, as we look into science, as we look into the different issues and um, debates uh, and findings of science, the scripture not only tells us to look, but, but it also tells us um, what to look for. First thing, um, science provides logical, this would be a fill in the blank if you're a fill in the blank or on your outline there, logical evidence, evidence. Science provides logical evidence. Check out Romans 1.20. Paul writing to the church in Rome, and he says this, for since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been seen clearly. So, so watch, watch here. So as, as you look and as you partake in, in the creation, and, and the idea is not this that you look, but that you study and you grow more acquainted with, with what's out there, the heavens, the earth, the sea, the body, the universe, all these sort of things. As you get better at understanding this stuff, what happens? His eternal power and divine nature 
are more clearly seen. Um, you learn about who this God is specifically, his e eternal existence, his always has been, always will be, his power and his godly nature. It's simply logical. And I love that because um, sometimes the, the argument is that well, science is like super logical and down to earth and you can prove it, but the things of faith are not. Like you just gotta jump and hope you're right. But that's not true. That's not true. The scriptures even give us clues as to how to approach science. It says, when you look around, this is proving something to you. It actually becomes logical evidence that there is a designer behind this, that there is someone sustaining this. And we're gonna talk about that in just a minute as we take on one scientific issue here uh, today and in, in, um, in just a moment. But, but just generally speaking, it gives us logical evidence. And I love this because um, in, in kind of coming up with different thoughts on like, well, well you know, like who else, what else can be included in a scientific message? Um, well. What's awesome is when one person says yes, it starts to add a little bit of credibility to it. But when multiple people are like, oh yeah, I get that, I get that, it, it, then it, it, like, it, it brings weight to the argument. And I just wanted to name a couple of influential scientists throughout history who have said yes to the death and resurrection of Jesus. Scientists who have influenced our culture who have also been captured by the person of Jesus and have been able to see God in science, not behind or against or separate. Scientists like the, uh, Descartes, New uh, Newton, Kepler, Galileo, Locke, Copernicus, Faraday, Kelvin, Pasteur, and then one, do you want me to tell you what they all discovered and, and give you a history of all of them? I can't. I don't even know if I pronounced all their names right, okay? Like, I'm a learner just like you. But what was awesome is I was on this website called alpha.org, one of the, one of the uh, resources I used for this uh, message, and it just started listing all these different guys. I'm like, wow, that's that gives me some comfort that, that like, I'm not the only one in. You know, when Jesus like, was brought back from the dead, he didn't just appear to one guy because we could probably disqualify one guy. He appeared to a ton of people who then would go out and die for the fact that that was true. Well, listen, I mean, they didn't all die, but, but there was a, a decent portion of them who suffered and then died. And, and when, I, when I look at like, well, what about logical evidence? Man, I'm glad to be in the same class of thinkers and people that I just named, especially the last one that I didn't name, whose name is Francis Collins. Now, you might know Francis Collins, and now listen, by the way, let me just, as I name these people, it doesn't mean that we agree with every single finding that they have about science or about theology or about life. It just means that they claim Jesus too and have severely influenced their culture scientifically. I think that's amazing. One of the things about, I was watching this interview on Francis Collins, and, uh, Collins he is, let me just give you some background on him. He's the most, at least one of the most significant scientific architects of our time. Why? Because he was the director of the Human Genome Project, where he was basically responsible for, obviously there was a team of it, but mapping the three billion letters in our DNA. Okay, so this is the guy who leads this project of this amazing like DNA discovery of the three billion letters in our DNA, mapping it and all these sorts of things. So Francis Collins, this is the guy, he sits out in this interview and he's talking about, you know, I was just a comfortable agnostic atheist. Like, that's just what I, who I was. That's what, that just, you know, it just kind of made sense to me. You know, like all these things over here made sense in the world of science. And then, you know, the things of faith, either I didn't have enough information or I did have enough information to just simply dismiss them. And, and one of the most influential things he says, at least to me as I listen to his interview, is that he realized he just never really considered the evidence. And he was a scientist. Like that was his whole life was considering evidence. And then he goes on to explain that once he considered the over overwhelming evidence, it was like, of course, Jesus, of course. 
The second thing that um, the scriptures uh, tell us to do as we approach science is to look for practical encouragement. Practical encouragement. As a matter of fact, our scientific endeavors, they help to actually uh, encourage us in Isaiah uh, 40, uh, verses 28 through 31. Now, now, when I put these verses up, up here, I give you like a, a portion of the verse. What I'd like for you to do there in your outline is go read the whole context because, you know, you'll, for space, this works, but, but it's important that you get the whole context. And, and, and the author Isaiah writes this about God, but then he says something incredibly important after that. Here's what he says. The Lord is the everlasting God, okay, Again, that eternal nature. The creator of the ends of the earth. He does not faint or grow weary. Later in this passage that I'm giving you, it then tells us, therefore, people like you and me who wait upon the Lord, when we walk and when we run, we also will not grow faint or grow weary. And so what's really cool about this passage is it's saying, okay, God, creator, intelligent designer, obviously that's the approach that the scriptures would tell us to take, and we're going we're gonna to unpack that here in just a little bit, but, but that's, that's our bias, if you will. You know, that's our, our scientific theology goes to a designer who's intelligent, loving, and creative. And, and so in, in this case, what's awesome about that is, as we unpack that is it not only gives us logical evidence, it also gives us practical encouragement. Science is not simply here to win our minds, it's also here to win our hearts. See, the Lord didn't give us creation and then go tell us to explore and learn about it to simply win our minds. He, 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 he knows the address of your heart. And this is also a heart matter, because here's what, here's what it says. Okay, so as you grow in your understanding of the creation, and thus the creator, you're going to learn that he never faints or grows weary. So that when you find yourself fainting and growing weary from your addiction, from your family, from your repetitive sin, from the gospel gap that still lives in your heart and is like, man, God, why have you not removed this? When that wears you out... You look around, you remember the understanding and the depths and the facts and the figures that point to there being a God who is a creator who, by the way, oh yeah, never faints nor grows weary. So when I rest my weariness in this God, I too can be restored. It's great encouragement. So if you have a surface level understanding of science and the things of creation and those sort of things, I would encourage you to grow deeper, to do more research, to go to some of the resources that I share in the recap, because not only will they be like, oh, wow, that's really something cool I could say to that person who just argued me under the table last week, but your heart will be like, oh, dang, that's my God. That's my God behind that. Of course when I grow anxious, he can handle that. He's holding the vastness of the expanding universe in his hand. He's got me too. And the last thing that it gives us is, it's not, so it's not only like logical, okay, I know some of you are like digging that. It's not only like encouraging. I know some of you, it's, it's also unique in the insights that it, that it gives. And uh, Colossians 1.16 tells us this, um, for by him, all things were created in, in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And, and whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. Sorry, I misread that. Visible and invisible, whether thrones or dominions or rulers or authorities, all things were created through him and for him. When we think about um, gifts, we begin to understand that they say something, not only about the person who's giving it, but also about the person who's receiving it, right? So for, for instance, um, you may not have known this or not, but I'm, I'm like a, I'm a big shoe guy, okay? So right now you're probably all looking at my shoes. It's totally cool, it's totally cool. Like just don't judge me, okay? Don't judge me because I'm a shoe guy. I just really, I'm really into shoes, I like shoes. And um, 
so is my son. My son, he's back there, my 13-year-old. And, um, you know, like when he buys shoes, it's, it's an event, you know? And like we look them up online. What do you think? We go back and forth. Why don't you like that? Color? Man, I just don't like that kid. And so we value our shoe game. Is it surfacy? Yes, I get it. Okay, like, so just don't, don't hate on it. It's just, I don't know why the Lord just like, kind of, kind of like a fun thing we're into. We're into our shoes. So as I look at this scripture, I'm reminded that creation was not only created by Jesus, but also given to him as a gift. So, so when, you, when you look at trees or you have a greater understanding of DNA, your, your premise, at least the, the, your theological premise is, this, is um, this was a gift given to Jesus, I'm probably going to be able to understand something about Jesus the more I understand about his gift. So my son in our shoes, right? So um, uh, yeah, you could probably see him now because I got my jeans rolled up, you know, and I, I was thinking about this moment, like, hey, I'm going to talk about these boots today because these boots were a big gift to me. Um, when I, uh, I, th I think it was one of those gifts where, you know, you like roll in a couple of things. You ever, you ever done that? Like, all right, let's let this count for and you're like three anniversaries, a couple of birthdays, and a Christmas, you know? And so, um, you know, I, I, I don't know all that was involved. I know it was Christmas and, and I was close to graduating. So I, I think I sort of manipulated um, like this, this big gift here and because these, these were like really expensive boots and I, like I did research, just like my son. I'm just an older version of my son, okay? And so did research, what do you think, back and forth. Anyways, got the boots, love the boots. Here's the deal. These boots say something about me. This gift, it actually says something about the person who received it. Here's a couple of things that it says about me. First of all, I'm super impractical. <laughs> like, why would you have boots in South Florida? It never snows. There's no, like, hills or mountains I need them for. I'm not on too many work sites, <laughs> ever, where I would need them. Um, yeah, so they're, they're, I'm, I'm a pretty impractical guy. You can, you can deduce that if I have boots that look like this in South Florida, I'm, I'm not your most practical dude, okay? Second thing you might be able to deduce or learn about the, the receiver of the gift is that there's probably, uh, I probably do something where I need to be somewhat formal but not overdressed. Okay, so if you look at the, you look and you're like, okay, this guy, he probably wanted these because he's probably in an environment where, like, he can't roll in and flops every day, but he's not wanting to wear, like, you know, $500 wingtips. He's, he's kind of, like, somewhere, you know, somewhere in the middle, and he probably is in environments most of the time where he wears pants, jeans, because these boots and shorts, that's a whole bad scene right there. <laughs> I do love them, and I, I would be willing to push the envelope, but not there. The last thing you might be able to learn about me from, from these boots is simply that uh, he likes stuff that's, that's kind of manly, but also like pretty stylish. So he's, got, he's, he's trying to like navigate that thing, you know? So hey, you might not, that might not be your opinion, but those are some things that you, as you look at, you're like deducing that. So what's cool about, about this, when, when we start to think about unique insight, Understanding that the more you dive into the world of science, the more you get unique insight about who it was created for. Are you with me on that? It's making sense in my mind. If you're with me, just give me a nod, some of you people. Are, okay, great, great. The more you understand about creation, the more you'll actually have unique insight about the one who was created for because it was not only just like functional, it was created as a gift. You'll understand things like, oh my goodness, Jesus, the one it was created for, must love creative things. He must love color. He must love seasons. He must love things that work together and produce something that couldn't happen if they remained separate. And you know what this guy, Jesus, must love most of all? He must love life. He must love seeing new things come to life. Hey, so evidence and, and, and you know, encouragement and, um, you know, unique 
insight into some of these things and will we'll talk to us, how does this like play out in, in maybe one uh, particular issue? John Piper says this, God means for us to be stunned and awed by his work of creation. What must this God be like himself? Well, is there an issue where we might be able to explore this a bit? We've got about, you know, 10, 12 minutes left here. What about God in science? So where, where in, in one particular issue would we be able to find uh, maybe some God in science? And the issue we're going to work through is intelligent design. We're going we're gonna to take a look um, at, at some intelligent uh, design. And, and so let's, we're going to unpack this from, a, again, a, a place of humility because that may not be your understanding. You're welcome here. You're, like, again, we're not confrontational. We're, we're just sharing a perspective that it seems as though is very consistent logically with what's going on out there and matches up incredibly well biblically. So we invite you to, to work through this with us, and we, we're going to have a Q&A panel at the end of this um, series on a Wednesday night, so there's about three, four more weeks here in this series, and we would invite you to come, and, and you, you'll get to talk, and we'll get to, to dialogue about, about some of these things. But let's, let's take a little bit uh, of a look at, at, at this idea of intelligent design, that like there's somebody um, behind uh, these, these things. And so uh, first, first sort of thought here is, is um, 19th century and 20th century uh, science. In the 19th century, uh, most scientific thought was that we existed always in what's called a steady state, a steady state, which means basically that we were a self-sustaining um, thing. So they, people might not call it creation, but like, like the universe as we know it, matter, science, it was all self-sustaining, like it didn't need any outside help. And so that was the prevalent thought in the 19th century. In the 20th century, um, scientific developments said that, that that's no longer the theory anymore. That the theory is that the universe can actually not sustain itself. It's dependent on someone or something outside of itself, and that it actually had a beginning. That there was a ton of energy behind this beginning, and that it's, it's continuing to expand. This became a, a popular in, uh, in the 1930s, and, and Sort of uh, one of the, the driving components to this idea of the universe actually having a beginning and, and someone thinking behind it is this idea called specified complexity. Specified complexity. Specified complexity is, is really just something that is really complex, but also specific in how it's supposed to work. All right, so it's got a lot of different pieces to it, but the pieces have meaning. Um, and, and basically the, the theory behind that is that if you just had the pieces, but they didn't work together, that would be one thing. Or if they worked together, but it was just one or two pieces, that would be another thing. But because there's such greatness in the diversity of pieces and the way they come together to work, it's like, dang, I know that's not really scientific, but that's my interpretation of our response. Like, Wow. So do me a favor, take out your phones, please. Take out your phones. I, click them on, please, click them on. And um, can you guys uh, just real quick either send me or somebody uh, a quick text, just say, hey, what's up? Checking out God and science. Go ahead and do that. I'm gonna just keep doing some stuff, but can you, can you guys um, go ahead and, and, and do that? Just shoot out a quick text. Um, and, then, and then I just kind of want to, pause there for a second and ask you, as you used the many pieces that you would call your iPhone or your smartphone, if logically you could say that just like came from something else or that just plopped down and happened out of nowhere, or potentially the greatest explanation for our gift right here that's blowing up. Thank you, Drew B. and David Slavic, Rob. Oh, my shoe's untied? It is? No, it's not. <laughs> Possibly the greatest explanation for what now is super consuming to our lives is that there was an intelligent designer behind this thing. 
that put a lot of pieces together to make it work to produce something beautiful. Specified complex, complexity. We can see this at work in, in the human body, right? Um, so we've got, we've got DNA going on. We've, we've already mentioned that. DNA, watch this, DNA contains codes uh, that are both specified and complex. Um, and they can't be explained uh, simply by natural causes. See, the, the, the codes communicate information and meaning, and it serves as the blueprint for life telling certain proteins exactly how to develop into biological systems, hummingbirds wing, uh, human brain. It's, it, 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 it's the code for, for how we are who we are. And it's incredibly complex. It would be really hard to begin to think about that as outside of some intelligent design. Now listen, you can. And, and I'm not saying that you're, you're, you're less than for thinking that. I'm not saying like that, that this, that, that what I'm proposing to you, which is a framework of intelligent design as it, as it appears in scripture, I'm not saying that, that this is, you know, that you should feel ashamed if you don't buy into this. I'm just saying dialogue with us. This is not presented from a top down. This is presented from like, hey, let's consider the evidence like our, like our buddy Francis Collin, Collins. Um, so in the human body, we've got this crazy DNA happening, and, and it's got amazing like predictability to it as well. Um, this guy Fred Herring from uh, just Scientific Writer says this. So we have often get the questions of why answered in God's word, and the how question answered in God's works. You see, so science gives us the how, God's word gives us the why, and the two come together. And when we study things like the human body and DNA, things that are amazingly complex, but also strategic in how they work, man, that's a great talking point for, is, is it possible, is, is it probable that there's a designer behind that who intended that potentially um, for good. The simple cell used to be called the blob of protoplasm. Um, basically, what this is described as is, is um, an, let's see here, an intricate interlocking networks of protein machines and assembly lines that are carefully regulated and controlled by multiple feedback loops. Um, there's like a skill of a designer that's behind that. John Bloom, professor at Biola, um, gives us that. What about the universe, man? What about the universe? It's this constantly expanding universe, and, and it's, watch this, the rate of expansion is such that if it were changed at the beginning by one part in 10 to the 60th power, that's a ton of zeros after one, if it was a little faster ma and matter could not hold together, if it was a little slower, the universe would have collapsed uh, a long time ago. Uh, this, that same writer from Biola talks about the world, and he basically says this, our, uh, the, our planet, and here's what he says. He's like, all right, here's the deal. Not only the universe, but specifically our planet, right? All right, who can handle the rock this morning? Who wants the ball? All right, there you go. All right, can you do me a favor? Hold that ball up with both hands and don't move it. Yeah, awesome. All right, so <laughs> here's the deal. Here's the deal. A according to scientific knowledge and data, the planet Earth is exactly where it is supposed to be. And as a matter of fact, wait, I just got to check it out and see if you moved it at all. <laughs> as a matter of fact, if there was even this, we're dead. Or if there was even this, we're dead. All right, now we got we to gotta, we hand this off to somebody who, who's like got mad athletic skills. Who in here is feeling, you're pointing to my son. You're pointing to my daughter. I don't think either of them want the ball right now. I know both of them. I don't want to hear about this later this afternoon. Who's going to handle this? I mean, Aaron Webb, amazing, great. Now listen, Aaron Webb has even a harder job than we just discovered here. So not only the placement of planet Earth, but also, hey, so here's what I need you to do, simple. I need you to spin this on your finger, okay, and, do, and, and leave it in the same spot that, that, that he did, not moving it to the left or the right. So can you go ahead and spin it, you know, like, a, like you spin a basketball? Go ahead, go and we're dead. We're super dead. We all just burned. I'm melting right now. Let's give him another chance. Look, he was nervous. It's no problem. Let's give him, go ahead one more time. And we died again. All right, listen. The, the premise here is that science teaches us that the way that our planet spins, its placement from the sun, it's, it's like sister 
plan, all these stories, the, the exact place of where it is, how it spins its weight, all that stuff. Man, if, if that's bumped and moved and disoriented, that's hugely bad news for us. When we think about, is there someone, something behind that? Not only having started it, but possibly sustaining it. Man, that's some pretty important information that we at least have to consider that there could be, there could be, there could even maybe probably be someone behind this. Hey, and so as we kind of finish our time here, um, we're, we're thinking about different things that, that point to our, our, our agreement with, with science and, and what we're learning and, and the fact that there, there's uh, potentially, again, we're dialoguing, potentially um, a designer uh, behind that. What does that say? What, is, what does that say? Well, so if we were to use our framework, evidence, encouragement, and insight, well, it gives us evidence that there's... Logically, I mean, this is what we're saying here, is that there's a, a God who's eternal, who was before this started, who created it out of nothing, and who's got sustaining power for it. There's some pretty decent evidence. Could you find another side to that that debates that? Of course. And that's totally cool to enter into that debate. It gives us some encouragement. If God is able to do what we are not every moment of every day, I mean, that encourages my heart to rest in that God. And it gives us some pretty awesome insight into his deep affection for those that he sustains. Man, that's just one issue. That's just one issue. I, there were other issues that we could have explored, uh, uh, and this was uh, from, from some of the stuff on how to talk to your kids about evolution. Um, human history, Noah's flood, cavemen, racial differences, dinosaurs. You, you got to check out the 10-minute recap where you can come to some of these resources and check them out because I know you guys are interested in this stuff and I know you guys in, are involved in, in, in relationships where this stuff matters, man. It, it, it all matters. But I'm convinced that Jesus changes everything. He changes our approach to science, right? He, he, he changes our approach, and, and I, I believe that Jesus would have us embrace science. If you know scientific friends and people who work in that world, learn from them. Embrace it. Like science is a gift to Jesus who then turns around and gives it back to us and says, if you want to know more about me, know more about this. I think that Jesus changes everything because he, he changes also our approach to those who disagree. We don't need to be argumentative. We don't need to be angry. Man, listen, the scientific community who, who would not have a biblical framework for these things, they're, they're doing the very best they can in their framework. So if you don't have God as a piece of your framework, then the logic that I'm explaining to you, you you're not allowed to use. So you've got to come up with other logic to explain sort of things. Man, that's okay. They don't have the peace that we have. We don't need to be angry or argument or think we're better than. I mean, let's just enter into that and think about what it would be like to know all the things that they know without a framework for God. I think he also changes our pro approach to hope. Because here's, here's like where science leads. I was asking the Lord, I'm like, Lord, where, where, how does science lead to Jesus, right? And here's, here's what I think he was telling me. Science ultimately leads to beauty. The more you understand how something works, the more you understand the significance of its beauty. And here's the thing about creation. It all points to Jesus because it all wears out and sings a song that says there's something better. And his name is Jesus. And he went to a cross for people like me who thinks the world revolves around them. People like you who suffer from that same sinful selfishness. And he says the beauty of the creator behind all this is that he came to free us and make us new creations that will forever exist in a new creation. And so Jesus went to a cross and there he was 
punished for my sin and for yours and the penalty that I deserve for breaking the heart of God the Father, Jesus took personally. And then on the third day, he overcame my death after he had finished paying for all of my sin. And the story of the gospel then invites us to not go get cleaned up, to not go get more information, but to simply come as we are and say, that's the God my heart has been yearning for, a God who would know me fully and love me because he's dealt with me through Christ. That's the God my heart yearns for. And so the path to that God is simply receiving the work and person of Jesus as a gift. Turning from all that you know outside of Jesus and saying, man, this life hasn't given me what I thought it would. Jesus, I surrender to you as my treasure, as my sacrifice as the way for me to be forgiven and made new again. As the way to be brought to life. Come to him by faith in that way and that's exactly what he does. And so our hope today that maybe even the beginning of this dialogue has had you thinking that there was an intelligent designer who actually had not only his son but you in mind would woo you to himself maybe even this morning. So as we prepare for communion, um, we'll have a, a, a few places where you can take communion. I'm going to ask our elders to prepare to serve the elements. We're going to play a song. And, um, the song is going to be called New Wine, and it's going to be talking about how basically God brings new things to life, like the pinnacle of science. And so... Here's who we invite to take communion. Man, we invite people who um, have surrendered their life to Jesus, who have come to a place of him being their treasure and their God, and um, they're not perfect. They're struggling and they're, and they're striving and they're, and they're continuing to, to reorient themselves to Jesus, and, and they actually know that they still need a Savior. And if that's you, we invite you to come. If that's not you, we just invite you to listen to the lyrics and just kind of chill and hang out and maybe let the Lord speak something to you that he's never spoken to you before if you find yourself in a place where you're a Jesus follower but you've got a hardness of your heart in a certain area then we, we would just say I'm going to give us a moment here we would either say drop that and then come or, or actually don't come examine your heart and ask God to renew that area and use today as a marker as when you left that out so I'm going to pray for us, and then you'll hear the song start, and you can come. There'll be three spots, and you'll take a, a cracker and a grape, grape juice, and you'll, you'll go back, and then we'll all take together. We'll, we'll close that way. So, Father, help us in this moment. We pray that you would do what you do best, which is not only create, it's not only sustain, but it's bring new things to life. Even now. Father, we want to believe that you're bringing people to life, that they can just, where they, where they are, they can say, Jesus, yes, I believe you died for me. Come into my life, forgive me, and give me that new life. I want to follow you. I want to know you. I want to be made new by you. I trust and receive you today. If you come to him in that way, Man, new life is yours. Come and celebrate that with communion. Jesus, to you be all the honor and glory. Amen. Amen. Captured by that song unexpectedly. Jesus, bring new wine out of me. That's what Jesus does. He doesn't just create. He doesn't just sustain. But he brings new things to life. And that's what this meal is about. And so as we take it, we're encouraged that he can do that again and again and again until he comes back and renews all things. On the night he was betrayed, he took the bread and he broke it and he said, this do in remembrance of how my body will be broken for you. Take it and eat. And on that same night, he took the cup and he said, this wine will be poured out when you
drink it, remember that my blood will be poured out for the forgiveness of your sin. Paul tells us it reminds us also that he's coming back to make all things new. Only Jesus is that beautiful. Take and drink. And so now I'm going to dismiss you with a benediction. I'd ask you to stand and I invite our prayer partners to come forward because there's going to be about two, two stanzas of a song we play after we dismiss. You're welcome to stay and sing a response to the Lord. You're welcome to be dismissed. You're welcome to come up for prayer. Uh, we'd love to pray with you and for you. We're believing that God was going to do um, something special this morning, so we'd love to join you in that uh, uh, for prayer. So if you're a prayer partner, make your way up please, at this time. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you and give you peace and hope and bring new things to life all over your heart, your mind, and your soul. Go in peace. Love you guys.